Hey everyone, welcome to the Forcecom Frontline. I'm Ashley and I'm your host. Today we're joined by the Commanding General and Command Sergeant Major of the Security Force Assistance Command, Major General Don Hill and Command Sergeant Major Don Ferguson. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, Ashley. So created in 2017, the SFAC is a division level command element for six security force assistant brigades. And that's made up of five regionally aligned regular army brigades, as well as one national guard brigade that is employed as an enabler across multiple geographic combatant commands. And so, you know, when we're talking about geographically dispersed when we talk about force comm units, we're used to places like Europe and, you know, the Middle East and even Africa but you have soldiers in places like the Philippines and Cambodia. Can you just talk about what your soldiers are doing in these different countries and the role that they have? Sure, and, and, but, but if I could Absolutely. really kind of um, set the, the tone of where we are now in 2023 compared to where we were in 2017, 2018, when we really stood the brigades up. Absolutely, because you two are the third yes. commanding general and yes. third command sergeant major. So this is a very right. young organization. Yeah, very, I tell people we're toddlers. You know, we're, we're, we're six, <laughs> going on six years old, still getting our feet underneath sure. us. Uh, and so very briefly, you know, we, we were established, there, there was a uh, Department of the Army execution order that established the SFABs to advise tactically CANDACs which was an Afghan infantry battalion. And so that, that order establishes for that specific mission uh, as part of what was then the plan to transition uh, the, the big army, the big brigade combat teams out of that okay. advisory role to, to protect them to train for large-scale combat sure. operations. And so we would create these advisor brigades purpose-built to, to go do that mission. Uh, at the time, we knew we were eventually going to get to a regional focus, but we thought that that was several years uh, down the road. And so we were built specifically for that security force assistance, stability operations in a counterinsurgency in Afghanistan. Okay. That, that was what the construct was that, that influenced uh, the doctrine, the organization, the structure, the, the equipment, and, and all those things. It was all about, we're going to go to Afghanistan. So things are changing now. Well, they have changed, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, current events, anybody listening, U.S. is no longer engaged in sure. Afghanistan <laughs> uh, in an advisory role. And so we, we, we are not there anymore. And so about 2019, 2020, uh, the regional alignment mission accelerated very rapidly. And the regional alignment was with the five active brigades. Each brigade would be aligned against a geographic combatant command. Okay. And so that was the next phase of our uh, evolution and development. Uh, remembering that we were built for this Afghan mission, mm -hmm. and so we, we really didn't change any organization or structure or, or equipment or anything like that. We took that force and we said, okay, now we're going to be regionally aligned. And each of the geographic combatant commands then you know, working through their Army Service Component Command said, okay, here's some advisors, these SFABs, go, 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 work, go to work. Let's figure this out. And so this is all going along the same lines with, hey, the Army and the Department of Defense is, is really focusing on competition with uh, what we now call our pacing threat China and then Russia right after them. And so the theaters were figuring out how would we use these advisors uh, in, in the various countries that we are partnered and allied with uh, to compete against those threats, but also to build partner capacity to, to get, you know, access and influence and establish a presence so that, you know, we could, you know, develop these relationships with these countries, especially in areas where we hadn't spent a lot of time previously because there had been so much focus uh, primarily, in, you know, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So that's, that's how we evolved. More recently, with the, the 2022 National Defense Strategy, you know, we are really looking at our role in large-scale combat operations. So not just working day-to-day -day with our partners. Currently, we're in about 34 countries. 
uh, we've, you know, we've been in um, a total of, um, you know, 74, or I'm, currently we have 74 teams uh, with about 700 advisors across 34 countries. That's today. Last year, we had 140 work, 141 teams with about 1,200 advisors uh, across 59 different countries, wow. you know, pr permanent presence, or not permanent, but persistent presence right. as well as episodic. So we, we've been figuring all that out, but we're also figuring out, you know, a year ago, the Russians rolled into Ukraine. And so, okay, how would we be involved sure. if the army was to go into this large scale combat operation type uh, scenario? So went from stability operations, counterinsurgency, regional alignment, keeping that regional alignment mission, but also figuring out what are we going to do? In six if, years. <laughs> yeah, right. We're, and then so we're learning, the Army's learning, the geographic combat commands are learning, our partners are learning. Sure. Uh, and what's really awesome is, you know, the advisors on the ground are learning and figuring this out. And we get incredible bottom-up feedback from these advisors who in some cases are in countries and working with partners that, you know, no conventional force is, is worked with any time in the recent future. In some cases, never. So it's it's exciting. You know, yeah. we're, we're still a startup. Uh, we were startup back in 17, 18. We're still in that startup phase sure. uh, as, as we figure out all these different missions and figure out how we can contribute to the Army's mission and, you know, deterring our uh, our potential threats that are out there as well as, you know, building building those relationships with our partners. I don't know if you want to jump in, sir, Major, on that. No, it's just, it's very, it's it's simple and yet it's complex. <laughs> That's yeah. the best way I can put that. So <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I don't really have anything to add to that. Desert. So Sergeant Major, I'll go, we'll go back to the initial question. So, you know, when we talk about advising in these other countries, can you just, what, what does that mean? It, it means many different things <laughs> to, in, in many different countries to many different teams. So as we go through our security cooperation objectives set by the, uh, the component commands, that is where that's really set on what they want okay. advi our advisors to do with our, our partnered uh, military force or army. Sure. So we, we always follow that. We stay within the lines on that. Um, sure. It's, it's a thing that uh, could be probably be frustrating at times. Um, you may want to help a partner force do something, and sometimes there's some authorities that prevent you from doing that. Yeah. But still, our, our main objective over there is to partner with these forces and train them within the realm of what we're told to do. Okay. And so, you know, we're talking about these soldiers who are advisors, and they come from across the Army. But this isn't a typical assignment for the soldiers that are in the SFABs. They go through a selection process. Um, so a couple of questions with that, I guess. Um, why a selection process? And and what do you hope, What what is the goal of a selection process? What are you hoping to achieve with it? Me personally, uh, the, hope, the goal I hope to achieve with the selection process is to get soldiers, NCOs, and leaders a character and put them through a five-day assessment where we test them physically, morally, and mentally and see how they come out in the end, and try to bring out the third persona. So, you, for instance, you may have an individual that's very good at their job, very good at PT, uh, a good leader in a, you know, in a, in a, what you'd normally sense in an Army unit that may struggle outside of that comfort zone. And so this assessment helps us bring that to the front and see who is really good at advising and who can partner and deal in, amb in ambiguity. Okay, that well, makes sense. And sir, there are some traits that you look for in advisors. Is that correct? Absolutely. Can we you talk we about those? attributes, and so to you know to add to what the sergeant major is talking about, um, just because you are a good squad leader or a good platoon sergeant or a good section sergeant in your MOS or a good company commander, uh, that doesn't always mean you're going to be a good advisor. Uh, we, you know, empathy is something that the Army's, you know, really, really uh, stressing these days, making sure that we can understand the, the other person and, and see them. Wow, that's, that's tough for some folks to do with another American. And now we're, we're doing it. We're asking young soldiers to do that with a foreign partner. Uh, they may or may not speak English, so there's the language barrier. 
There's the obvious, you know, cultural uh, differences uh, which which exist as, as soon as you step outside the United States. I mean, we've got cultural differences within the United <laughs> States. Uh, and, and now we're going to countries where, um, you know, potentially radically different value systems. And so now we, we, we need to make sure you're not just competent, that's absolutely critical, but you can respect the person that you're talking to, you can, you can understand their perspective, and, and we like to say you, you need to be the advisor that your partner needs. Yeah. And that, that sometimes that means that you, know, you don't just go in and go, hey, I'm the American, I'm here to tell you how to do everything. It may be, hey, wh- wh- what do you think you know, do you need my help? Do you just want me to watch? Yeah. Do you just want me to stand here? You know, you want some feedback. Some some cultures are more receptive to external feedback than others. Like any like any you know personal relationship, you probably need to build a relationship to enable folks uh, to listen to you. Which means maybe you you do a lot of the listening up front. Yeah. So that's. You know, to the to Sergeant Major's point, we, we want to make sure we're getting the right folks that we can take out of this, you know, very type A, very biased for action culture of the United States Army for, for good reasons. But then, okay, take that and make sure you can apply that in an environment where you're dealing with somebody that does not work for you, does not answer to you, may not want you to be there, but we still need you to help so try interesting. to advance. it's 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 like you said it can be it can be frustrating for advisors sure um but uh, general miller when we were in afghanistan he said advisors can't be frustrated they've got to <laughs> they've got to work through those challenges yeah. uh to accomplish the mission and that's what it's all about well in you know you go a couple of thoughts here so i talked to an advisor probably last year who was from the philippines went back to the philippines right. as part of his his team and his his connection to the culture and being able to speak the language he said was such a huge help now obviously that doesn't happen on every team in every country that you go to but i can imagine that having that really helped build that team and that relationship in that country um so it's it's just it's interesting and i had another thought but it went away so we'll move on (laughs) well well, if i could you know what one of the things that we learned early on you know the language we get asked a lot about. Hey, what's your language program? Uh, and if you're in first SFAB, which is aligned against Southcom, then Spanish is the language. Now, granted, you know they got the Portuguese aspects of uh, uh, in Brazil and that area, but it's primarily if you learn Spanish, that's gonna that's gonna really help with your relationships in South America and Central America. But if you're an advisor in Indo Pacom, yeah. okay, which language do you pick? Right. Uh, if you're an advisor in Africa, which which language do you pick? And so while the language isn't always going to be something in a short amount of time that we can get an advisor spun up on the cultural aspects of your partner, that's something that, you know, you, I can explain that to you in English. And I was going to say, is that something that advisors go through before they go to a country? Yes. yes. Okay. In, in, in the fact that we have advisors in these countries and then we we go heel to toe in a lot of cases where one team replaces another sure. team you've got those experienced advisors that come out and then go hey let, yeah. let, let, let's share this and it's it's the it's the good handoff on the culture but it's also the handoff on the relationship Absolutely. with the partner so it's it's the cultural aspects of that partner Absolutely. Uh, which is good I would think too and I'll, I'll go to you sergeant major if you are advising on your craft helping another person um, do what you do, learn, learn, learn something, you're taking something away from that as well. So you're going back to your unit, your next unit potentially with, you know, as, as a master of your craft or your fundamental, I would, I would think. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that up because I, I think it's the American mentality as we go and we help people and we're awesome and it's great. And I can tell you it's a lot more reciprocal than that. Um, so you're, you're helping possibly someone that there is a language barrier with learn your craft. So that helps with the language barrier. It also builds rapport. Yeah. But that, at that same time, you're, you're getting a whole different view of how they may view how to do something, whether it's through their institutional processes or just where they're from. Yeah. So you're gaining that, which is going to help you 
down the road wherever you may go. Yeah. So the language barrier, although it sometimes can be difficult, it's actually helping you grow and become a better teacher and mentor. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, the benefits of, a, of an SFAB uh, assignment. Um, is it a broadening assignment? Is, you know, if, if I decide I want to be in an SFAB, how does that help me as I move and I progress throughout my career in the Army? From what I've seen of the more of the senior folks that I've come across in SFABs, um, they're, they're moving on and taking battalions, at least on the enlisted side, and they're eventually taking brigades. So the, the, definite, the benefit is definitely there. With regards to it, uh, you know, the immediate, I think people are being developed and broadened, and sometimes they may not even realize yeah. they're being developed and broadened. And let's just say, for instance, uh, we just visited Poland a few months ago, and there's a team over there assigned with a Polish field artillery battalion. Yeah. So, and they're doing great. I mean, they're, they're making lifelong friends. They're still doing what they're supposed to. They're not going outside, you know, the box. You know, they're, they're, they're sticking to what they're told to do. And then this individual uh, will most likely PCS to another unit, go to that unit, be eligible for promotion, get promoted, and then could possibly be on a rotational unit with a BCT back to Poland. That individual's experiences throughout that are going to be invaluable to Absolutely. his command or her command. Absolutely. Um, and, and even if they don't go back to Poland, right. you know, they, they yeah. again, they've been exposed to that culture and they've been exposed to, hey, look, hey, folks, subordinates, <laughs> when we go to this country, <laughs> let's not be the ugly Americans. <laughs> And, and so that some of those advisor attributes, those, those are just good people attributes. One hundred percent. I just think too, you know, like I started with, you you think about countries like even Germany and Poland, but to go to places like the Philippines and learn cultures like learn about that culture um, and get to experience that for it's six month month rotations, right? Well, it, it's potentially. Okay. And, and so we have persistent engagements, and then we have some episodic. Okay. So there may be, and this is based on what the combatant command wants sure. and what their campaign plan is. So, yes, we, we have cases where a, an advisor team will go to a country, and they will be there for six months. But there may be another case where uh, we send an advisor team on a, what we call an episodic engagement for a period of weeks couple of months or while they're in one country they may leave that country go to another country okay. and then come back to the country that they're at so it's it's really based on the mission what the requirements are the exercise programs sometimes our advisors will be you know in a country um, you know let's, let's as an example they're in Indonesia they're with a partner and then that partner is going to come back to an American Combat Training Center, NTC or JRTC, yeah. for a rotation. Our advisors will help prepare them for that rotation and then come back with them, oh. work with them through that rotation, and then go back to oh, you know, their home country. Uh, which, again, back to you know, the developmental aspects of that yeah. uh, that the Sergeant Major was talking about. I mean, that's you know, a CTC. I mean, that, that's what separates us from the rest of the world. Our CTCs are fabulous. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's great when you can go. But now you've got to go as an advisor, and you're helping this other foreign country yeah. you, you know, organization be successful in that kind of environment. What a challenge, yeah. what, and what a great opportunity for you to grow uh, as, a, as a leader and as a, as a soldier. Absolutely. And so I want, we'll, I want to talk about this later, but let's just go to it now. So we're talking about these teams, and, and really they are called force packages. That's, that's the whole Educate group. Me. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> so so, <laughs> so I, I left, I, I stood up second SFAB uh, okay. from 18 to and I was there till, till 20, and we were trying to figure out, okay, what's this going to look like when we become regionally aligned? Okay. Because the whole brigade went to Afghanistan, most of it. Some of it went to Iraq. But then the, uh, the regional alignment, we were like, okay, what's this look like? And so we, the Army has a rearm cycle, right. eight months long. Ours is six months long. Okay. And so we build force packages for that six-month period, and those teams – uh, there's, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Battalion Commander, one of the battalion commanders within the brigade, hit their headquarters, are in charge of that force package. And that force package is built based on the requirements of that command command, that service okay. component command for that six-month window. Okay. 
And so they go, and again, they, it, you know, the whole force package might go for six months. Yeah. Part of them might go for six months. The other part might go in and out episodically. Okay. They might all go to one location and then bounce around within that theater. It really depends on the needs of that combatant commander and what they want them to do with those partners. Because there's, there's more countries out there that want advisors than there are advisors. And so wow. some places we go and we hang out for six months. Some places we, like I said, bounce around. And it's really what, you know, what that combatant commander wants. Okay. Is that, that yeah. the answer yeah, to the force it, package? It and does. rotate every six months. And I, was, I mean, you, you answered my next question, too, um, you know, talking about a consistent presence or a I'm gonna not remember the word episodic that you, yes episodic, <laughs> um, yes and I was gonna how do you determine where 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 that presence need to be but it, right. it sounds like the combatant commander is really right it's it's really you know they have a theater campaign plan uh and and you know what are the, what do they want to achieve you know do they want to you know build a certain capacity within a partner that they want to expand a relationship uh do they you know are, are we work with um, uh, USASAC, which is the Foreign Military Sales Command. And so, you know, if, if we are fielding, uh, like, for instance, everybody's talking about uh, the M1s that are going to some of our partners in, uh, in, in Europe, um, you know, we, we can work with the command to help in those fieldings. Okay. You know, the contractors come in and they're all button, flip this button and turn the switch and this is where you start it and this is how you change the tire. And then after a period of time, they leave. Right. Well, we're, we're still there and then we can say, hey, this is, this is how we organize this, this around this platform. This is how we fight this platform. Uh, this is how we maneuver it. This is how we sustain it over time. Okay. And so that's something that's really uh, newer with our approach to advising is, you know, we call it the advisor network at Echelon. You know, we're not just there teaching you how to shoot the rifle. We're, you know, teaching you how to shoot the rifle. We're teaching, if, if they're advising on, you know, the, the force generation that builds the rifleman at the basic training to go to the unit, the depots that sustain the rifles with ammunition and spare parts. That's the beauty of all our advisors. We've got such a diverse array of MOSs that, you know, we, we can embed it at, at Echelon so that, you know, if there's challenges, there's issues, we've got advisors that can help with that. It's so interesting to think, you know, you go into, you're, you're in an SFAB, you deploy how much you're learning about the army even i mean to to go and and teach these other other countries how the army does how our army does things that's a great point so even even to you know to build on that i mean you're you're getting strategic experience at a rank that that you would never get it at possibly somewhere else. Yeah. I know I didn't get it as a staff sergeant or sergeant first class. So just being like one, what is it? One cap, uh, one captain, one team, one country. So you have a captain, sergeant first class or master sergeant with their team in a country. You are the Americans in that country. You know, you're reporting to either the ambassador or to the FAO. So it's immediate strategic impacts and you know there's there's good that can come with that and there's bad that can come with it i always try to focus on the good so one of the stories i like to tell is you're a, let's say you're a young captain in country x in either maybe south america or or africa and look at it like you could be partnered with a young captain from that country's army that's the future st chief of staff of that army the future you know so i mean the impact that you can have generationally which helps our strategic goals too. Yeah. When we have friends and partners, is just it's just not something you're going to get. I don't think. There's probably some places in the army for it, but traditionally, yeah. and you know, your your traditional units, you're you're just not going to get that type of experience. Absolutely. The if I could add to that yeah. too, the um, you know that that captain is probably not advising another company commander. They're probably advising a battalion commander. Sure or maybe even a brigade commander. Uh, and so when you start doing that, uh, one of the things that, that we are doing is we're, we're, we pull people out of their comfort zone. <laughs> and that's the non-commissioned officers and the officers. Uh, we were just, uh, Sergeant Major and I were visiting, you know, seeing the, the validation exercises that we do for these force packages. And the scenario had, 
you know, young, you know, company grade officers and NCOs advising at battalion and brigade levels. And that's, you know, I ask, you know, hey, any of you all been on a battalion or brigade staff? You know, and everybody's like, nope. <laughs> and so that's that's a challenge, but that really speaks to the quality of the folks that we bring in, that they are up to that challenge. And they will go do the self-development, and we have training to, to get them to where they can understand that, that next one or two levels up, uh, which, you know, gets them to where they're capable of being the advisor that their partner needs, but then... You know, when they go back out into the United States Army, they 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 are totally prepared Absolutely. to operate at that next level, uh, which is you know we think what what part of our responsibility to the Army is you know we get good people, yeah. but we give them back even better yeah. uh, to continue to do good things in the Army. I have so many questions still, and I know we're not going to get to everything, but I do want to talk. Um, General Pappas talks a lot about the future fight, um, and so I know that that the SFAC. SFABs are doing a lot to um, to help us get to the Army of 2030. Can you just talk about what's happening? Right. So, so one of the one of the things that we are doing, and you know, I talked about how we've evolved over time. Yeah. And so, to get to that future fight is, you know, making sure that we as advisors, you know, we're not just in competition, but if you know, if the, the big one starts, uh, that we have a role to support the Army in large-scale combat operations. And so we are evolving that. We are you know, refining our doctrine. Uh, we have tabletop exercises where we look and you know, put ourselves in those scenarios and go, okay, how would we, how would we contribute to this fight? Uh, we are integrating uh, in things like uh, the Army's Warfighter Exercise Programs, which train the division and corps. We, we, we are not the training audience for those, but we are participating in those so that the, the divisions and corps are thinking about us and they're thinking about how they would employ us uh, so that we can work together to figure out how we can be value added. And then internally, we have refined and evolved our collective training programs to where we are working more closely with the combat training centers and we've built our own you know, CTC-like uh, operation in, um, in Camp Atterbury, Indiana, in Muscatatuck okay. Urban Training Center, so that we can, again, ex explore and experiment and train for that type of fight to make sure when called upon, we can, we can be there and, and be value added to the, to the force. And so that's, again, that, that wasn't really thought through very well six years ago. We are thinking through that now, and we are nested with, you know, Forces Command and the rest of the Army to, to make sure that we, we are doing things that are going to help that, that fight. Absolutely. Um, and Sergeant Major, real quick before we run out of time, we've talked a lot about advisors and we've talked a lot about these teams that come together. We're talking about soldiers from across the Army coming together into these teams. Um, and another one of the CG's big, big things is engaged leadership. Um, how, how do you, how, or what are you seeing? How, how are you making sure that these teams are coming together and that they are engaged and they are cohesive? What are some of the things that you're seeing or doing to, to get your teams there? When we, basically, it all starts once they make it through our assessment and selection. So the, the, the right people are, are coming to us okay. once, once they make it through that. They show the advisor attributes, whether they even know they have the, the attributes sure. or not. And I went through that briefly. But in, in the foundation, the way we have it set up, we have about a six-month period where these teams come together. And they train as a unit. They train on their basic skills. And some of the basic skills they're going to train on, they may have, may have never trained on before because they're going to be people on the team with them that have, they have never worked for across MOSs. So the level of training coming from, let's say, the individual that was tasked to train you on this and does a pretty good job of it, these folks, that's their MOS, and they're training you on their MOS to make yeah. them more inclusive. And, and so as that goes along and it builds through the six-month process and we go into the collective training, that's where we really see where the teams meld and how they do as they're moving towards their validation exercises in preparation for the employment that they're going on. So the, the process is not fast by any way, shape, or form. So one sure. of the things we do is we build it in. We build it into the rearm cycle. They have time to integrate as a team, build their teams, go through the foundational, into the collective, then into the employment. So time is one of the things we're using. 
training. There's other schools they can go to, uh, specifically the uh, combat advisor training course down at Fort Penning that get, gets everybody on the same sheet of music. Okay. Uh, this person's good at this. This person may not be so good at this. It brings them all up to the same level. So they all have the same understanding as they go through the foundation on the collective process. I would assume, and maybe I'm wrong, you know, going to some of these countries where you you don't know the culture and maybe nobody on your team is familiar with the the culture or speaks the language going through that experience together i'm sure probably brings these teams together too somewhat um just going through that ex shared experience and you know that that would be the case if it were a new mission in a new country so that's definitely something they have to prepare yeah. for and they will do that and they'll prepare for that mission in their collective phase which is focused towards that country uh, many times it's it's a handoff one team replacing another way and say what some shape or form and yeah. they're all part of the same brigade so all that data and all that information is shared before they get in country Absolutely. so we're running out of time you guys are busy um but i want to let each of you have a final thought before we let you go so i'll start with you sir or you want me to go start major sir with sergeant major, okay, sir major. I'll, I'll be quick <laughs> um uh the sfabs are a great organization um we need and want volunteer leaders of character and competence i prefer character we can build confidence. Yeah, and you know, with, like, like I said earlier, you know, we, we were created for one mission. We have evolved, uh, and right now we are meeting the mission requirements that the Army has identified for us. So there was uh, there was some concern, especially after we you know left Afghanistan. Hey, you know we don't we don't need the SFABs anymore. They're going to go away. Uh, nothing could be further from the <laughs> truth. Uh, I've had this conversation with the Chief Staff. I've had it with the Secretary of the Army. Uh, we are a high demand force across the combatant commanders. Uh, they all uh, want more advisors. They wanted more advisor teams. There's there's not enough of us uh, to. Know Know us is to love us you know whether you're a, a country or a combatant command and so you know we we, we need those advisors that the the sergeant major is talking about uh, to do a mission that the army has identified that it needs for competition but also in anticipation of potential conflict and so you know we're, we're, we're doing what the army wants us to do and we're doing the best we can at it and uh, we're going to continue to evolve and and get better so that we can be very effective whatever the army needs us to do and sir, real quick, you've seen the evolution of the SFAC, SFAP, I never know which one to say, um, because you you helped build the second. Yes. So yes. you have really contributed to this well, organization. I'm a plank holder, <laughs> uh, watched it from, from, from watch first from the job I had and yeah. supporting first being built, then got the, uh, the honor and privilege of building second, so I am... Uh, I've obviously biased. All uh, in. I'm all in <laughs> and, and firmly believe in this in this mission. This was uh, General Milley when he was Chief Staff of the Army. This was his brainchild, and uh, you know he had a vision, and we have definitely achieved that vision. And I would argue have gone beyond that vision, yeah. and are like I said, we're we're doing what the Army needs us to do, what the Department of Defense needs yeah. us to do in support of uh, of the the nation. So. Yeah. Firmly believe in it. <laughs> well, I know you guys are both busy, but I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, I know you're only down the hall from us here in Forcecom, so thanks for stopping by. <laughs> thanks for having us, Ashley. Absolutely. It. Appreciate it.